uh, just to give you a little bit of background, I started uh, lifting weights when I was 13 years old. I started competing when I was 16. I won my first show when I was 16. When I was 18, I won the uh, Junior USA and took second to Sean Ray in the Teen America um, the following year. No, actually, the same year. Um, so my goal was to become a professional bodybuilder at that point. Uh, but I got caught up in some stuff, and when I was 20 years old, um, I got arrested. And basically what happened was uh, I had a girl living with me, and she took off with my car, and it had a trunk load of steroids. <clears throat> and she didn't bring it back. Well, I found out where she was. I went to collect my car with my stuff, and they called the police on me. At that time, steroids were, were just a misdemeanor. It wasn't a felony. So they weren't really, I had, you know, several large boxes of steroids and they also found a uh, Mac 11 380 machine gun in my car. Why I had a machine gun? I did not need a machine gun. Looking back on it, that was the stupidest thing I ever did was get a machine gun. But I was at a gun show, they were selling machine guns. You know, at that time Arnold Schwarzenegger was on Terminator with a machine gun. So I thought it was cool to have one. I wasn't trying to shoot anybody or anything. I just thought I, this was a cool thing, so I bought this thing, and I just had it. They found that, and they just went crazy. And so they were charging me with all kinds of stuff. Uh, attempted kidnapping, attempted burglary, attempted murder, everything. I didn't, if I was trying to do anything, it would have happened. I wasn't attempting anything, I just wanted my car back. But they were, were not happy about that, and I was only 20 years old. I didn't know the court process, so uh, they threw me in LA County Jail, which is uh, one of the worst places that you could possibly be. And I spent a year in there fighting my case, and I could say that pretty much every single day of LA County Jail, I was in a fight. Whether you you know want to fight or not, you're going to be fighting in LA County Jail. It'll just happen. I remember one time I came back from court, and I was laying on a bunk and they just threw a bunch of stuff at me in court and I was just in a daze. I couldn't believe what was happening. And I'm sitting there staring off into space and this guy says, hey, what are you looking at? I'm like, what? He said, why are you staring at me? I said, I'm not staring at you. He goes, you're staring at me. I said, look, man, I just got a lot of problems. You know, I had a bad day. I'm not staring at you. He goes, well, I don't think your problems are any worse than mine. I said, what? Next thing you know, I'm fighting 10 dudes. <laughs> they ended up throwing me in segregation, which for me, that was a good thing. I was like, thank God, lock me up, away from these idiots. So uh, I was in the county jail fighting this case, and uh, I had a really bad lawyer, and uh, they were trying to tr give me life and all this craziness. And, you know, I'm 20 years old, and I don't, I don't know what's going on. Actually, my lawyer came to me one day, and he says, he pulls me out, and he says, uh, you need to tell me, tell me about the murders. And I'm like, what? He says, tell me about the murders. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. He goes, listen, I can't help you unless you're honest with me. Tell me about these murders. Who did you kill at Gold's Gym? I'm like, I have no idea. You're crazy. I didn't kill anybody. He gets all mad. He runs out of there huffing and puffing. I, I'm just, I have no clue what's going on. Well, there's this jailhouse informant guy, and he made up a story that I told him that I killed somebody at Gold's Gym. Well, my lawyer comes back the next day and says, Great news, we checked it out and no one got killed at Gold's Gym. Really, thanks. <laughs> so anyways, they're, they're coming at me with all kinds of crazy stuff and my lawyer's like, they're offering you life, you could take it and get out in 10 with good behavior. I'm like, I just, I'm, I'm like, for what? I didn't kill anybody. I, this is just crazy. Anyways, they kept pressuring, pressuring me, like, you have to take this deal. So they came back with uh, 12 years and eight months, which I was, and my lawyer's like, you have to take this. They're going to, they're going to hammer you. You're going to get worse. And I remember uh, when it came time for sentencing, I'm standing there and they're telling me to plead guilty. And I, and they're saying, they're reading the charges and I, I'm, I didn't want to say it because I'm thinking I didn't do this. And my lawyer's like, you have to freaking do it. Take the deal. I'm 20 years old. If it was today, I'd have told that lawyer to go jump out of a freaking plane. And I, I took it because I didn't know what else to do. You know, 20 years old, they're telling you, you know, you don't take this, you're going to get 150,000 years or whatever they're telling you. I remember I took it and I was just blown away. I didn't know what to think. 
So after I took it, then they uh, sent me to Chino, which at that time was a reception center. And we're there waiting to get designated to wherever you're gonna go. And one day they come and they call everybody to the front and they're telling people where they're gonna go and they tell me that I'm going to Corcoran. So I start asking people, what's Corcoran? And they go, oh, you're going to gladiator school. <laughs> oh, great. I go, oh, that's the worst place you can go. Oh, wonderful. So I get on this bus and we're driving in the middle of nowhere, somewhere out in the desert. And we pull off the road and it's just nothing but sand out there, not anything green for as far as you can see. And way off in the distance, I see this little silver speck. We keep driving towards it and it's getting bigger and bigger. And we finally pull up to Corcoran and it's nothing but cement and barbed wire and towers. And we pull up to these huge gates. These guys are standing there with machine guns. And I'm looking as we're about to go in there, I'm like, oh, I really fucked up now. <laughs> this is bad. So we go in there and uh, take us off the bus and they're escorting us in there. And uh, I remember, I don't know what was going on, but they took us through this bee yard and everybody's mad dogging us as we were going through. And I'm like, Jesus, what did we do? This is bad. But they put you in a segregation for the first week you're there. So they locked me in there with this guy. He had a parrot tattooed on his head, bald guy. Come on, I'm 20 years old. I've never seen anything like this. And, uh, but he was a cool guy and he told me, don't worry, it's gonna be all right, whatever. So they take me and they put me on a level three yard. And, uh, you know, it was a pretty bad place, I guess. They have a lot of stabbings there. And there was a lot of violence all the time. I, right when I got there, I had to fight a guy in the cell just to prove something. And, you know, they, like, you have to go fight this guy, some big guy. So I went and did that. And then they, they kind of left me alone after that. Um, I was in Corcoran for, I don't know, a little over a year. And I could say it pretty much sucked. It sucked bad. Uh, like I said, there was constant violence. There was always tension. People getting shot, people getting stabbed. I mean, this is like normal everyday stuff. Somebody's getting stabbed, somebody's getting shot. This is what happens every day. It's, you just learn to stay against a wall wherever you're going. And there's always tension there because at any given time, something's going to happen. There was a couple race riots while I was there. And uh, finally, I get to uh, on a medical to go to a place called CMC in San Luis Obispo. And I was lucky that my mom's husband at the time was a psychologist, and he had a friend who was also a psychologist at CMC. So I went in there where they call uh, observation, and he pulled some strings and got me to stay there, which was good because I don't know if I had to spend that whole time in Corcoran, I don't know what I would have been like coming out of there. And it, uh, CMC wasn't a bad place. Uh, I pretty much stayed to myself, but uh, they had a good gym there. And one thing they did have was college. They had Chapman College. It was actually real Chapman College. The, the uh, teachers would come from the college right there in San Luis Obispo and come in and teach. And uh, I knew I just had to do something with my life because like I said, I didn't wanna, this was not for me. I didn't want to spend my life in prison. I seen people that were, you know, doing life in prison. A lot of people in there were doing life in prison. I mean, I was in there with uh, Tex Watson and people like this, and they're never going to get out. And I was like, this is just not for me. So I basically went to college the whole time, and uh, minded my own business and lifted weights. They had powerlifting meets back then in those days, and I used to always win the powerlifting meets there, which pissed a lot of people off because here was this kid winning the powerlifting meets. They didn't like that. And I, I just went to school. But I can tell you, um, after a few years there, I became pretty numb to everything. I didn't get mad, I didn't get sad, I didn't cry, I didn't be happy, I was nothing. There was no emotion in me at all. I mean, none. I could care less. I hated everybody there, I hated that place. I just wanted to get out, and that's it. I didn't want to have friends in there. I mean, I had a few friends, but I knew I wasn't staying there, and I just became totally numb to everything. And it took me a while when I got out to adjust from that, you know, just to get used to real life again. Um, but one thing was good, when I did get out, I went back to school uh, to finish up my degree at Cal State Northridge, and I started working a lot because I needed to make money. So I got actually five different jobs 
And uh, one of the jobs was working for Vector Marketing selling knives, and we went li literally door to door selling knives. And I was real, real good at that because I didn't have a problem with rejection because I didn't care. <laughs> Someone tell me no, I was just like, whatever. And uh, so I ended up doing real well at the knife selling job and ended up getting promoted to, to a management job. And I ended up being district manager with them for about 10 years and did pretty well. Originally, if you want to understand how this all came about, you have to go back in time quite a bit uh, when uh, ben Johnson, uh, the Canadian sprinter, was competing against Carl Lewis and he tested positive for Stanozol, which is an anabolic steroid, and Carl Lewis accused him of cheating. We know later down the line that Carl Lewis was also on steroids, so it was a big bunch of nonsense, but that's what kicked it all off, the big political thing. Later down the line, uh, the Balco uh, situation happened, which was there was a lab up in San Francisco that was a actually a, a vitamin lab that was run by a guy named Victor Conte, and he was producing designer steroids that uh, for the Olympic athletes so they could get past the test. And a few Olympic athletes got busted on that, and then the whole ball club scandal happened. And that the prosecutor at, who was involved in that. Um, kicked off this big, uh, what's, what's the term I'm looking for, crusade. He started with the Balco scandal and then he went into baseball, going after Barry Bonds and all them, and then it became headlines. And this same guy is what pushed the uh, Anabolic Control Act that uh, made steroids a <coughs> a felony. Because back when I was coming up, it, it was just a regular prescription drug. It wasn't even illegal. It wasn't until 1990 they did the Anabolic Control Act and made it a felony. So this same guy uh, who prosecuted Balco and he prosecuted Barry Bonds and so forth uh, decided they were going to make a big statement in the news. So they went around the world rounding up steroid labs everywhere from different countries and the United States as well under the auspices that they're cleaning things up for the Beijing Olympics. And it was just a big political thing to make headlines. The truth of the matter is none of us had anything to do with the Olympics. It wasn't even related to the Olympics, but this is the headline they made. So they, they actually extradited British citizens from Thailand and to the United States to stand trial and so forth. And they shut down uh, pretty much all the labs. And I was one of the last ones to go down because I was in Mexico and I was kind of watching this all happen. And I thought I was safe being over there in Mexico because I figured I hadn't broken any laws. Uh, but when you've got conspiracy, you know, you don't actually have to do anything. They just have to say you did it and prove you didn't do it. So uh, that's what kicked off uh, what they called Operation Raw Deal in 2006, 2007, where they just rounded everybody up and took down all the big labs. And the way they actually got everybody was through something called Hushmail. Hushmail was an internet server through Canada that was encrypted email and everybody, and it was guaranteed that it was safe because it was out of Canada and it was encrypted and they swore that they didn't give it up to anybody. Well, the US government went in there and made a deal with the Canadian government and they gave it all up. So everybody's everything was on Hushmail and they just had a map of everything that everybody had been doing. So that's how they ended up pretty much getting everybody. Um, the way they got me actually, I was pretty hidden down in Mexico, but I had a worker who was just a, a bottler, he was a nobody. And uh, about eight months earlier, he, he was on meth and I didn't want that around because I didn't want to bring that heat around me and I just didn't want that around my family either. So I told him he had to get up, get up, get on his way, and uh, I kicked him out. Well, he got busted doing some meth thing, I guess, at the border, and uh, he he's the one that ended up uh, telling them where I was. I found this out later, after the fact. But they never caught me with one pill, one anything, that in the United States. In Mexico, yeah. But they said, conspiracy to distribute, they said, this product was found in the United States and it's your product, so therefore you manufactured it with the intent of it going to the United States. 
There were some people in Northern California that got busted with a bunch of different products from a bunch of different labs, and that's what kicked off this whole thing. So that's basically how it all came about. When I first uh, got this case, actually I was living in Mexico. I had a lab down there. And I actually went to Mexico because uh, steroids were legal in Mexico, not here. Uh, when in 2007, Operation Raw Deal took place, and basically they went around the world rounding up people from different countries and extraditing them and so forth. Uh, I thought I was safe because I was down in Mexico and I was outside their jurisdiction. Well, what happened was the US DEA contacted the Mexican police and they sent the Ariana Felix cartel to come get me in the middle of the night. So uh, I'm sitting in bed watching a movie with my wife in the middle of the night and my door flies open and I have M16 with laser sights in my face from all directions. And uh, these guys were in full SWAT outfits. Uh, basically looked like uh, the police, but they weren't. And uh, I said to them, are you the police? And they said, yeah, we're the police. I said, okay, don't hurt her. They hit me in the face with a rifle, pushed me to the ground with a gun in the back of my head, handcuffed me. And they took me out into the uh, hallway and asked me for what the combination to the other safe was. Um, I learned later on that one of my workers actually routed me out to the cartel and told them about the other safe, which was underground. Uh, and then one of their guys yelled at them that somebody was coming. They had to get out of there. So they took me upstairs, uh, threw me in the back of a van and threw a blanket over my head and were taking me away. I was pretty sure they were going to take me to kill me somewhere. At that point, my heart was beating so hard that uh, I thought I was going to have a heart attack right under the blanket. They transferred me to another vehicle and they took me to a safe house somewhere, I'm guessing, near Tijuana. Uh, escorted me up there and put me in a little room uh, that had bars on the windows and a small cot. And just basically left me there overnight. And the next day they came to me and said, uh, what is a combination to the other safe? And honestly, I didn't even know what the combination was. It was a real difficult safe to get into and I'd only been in it a few times. So I started trying to explain to them it's difficult to get into the safe and they said, well, we're gonna play a little game. So I already had a gauze wrapped around my head as a blindfold so they stuffed more uh, gauze in my mouth and finished wrapping my whole head up and then they proceeded to use my head as a punching bag for a minute. And then the guy said, um, grabbed me around the head and pulled me down and said, um, I don't want you to think about yourself, think about your family. And then they uh, took the pliers and started yanking my toenail out. That was uh, a, a little bit painful. So my whole body seized up and went into convulsions and uh, they did that for a minute. And they said, okay, so you're gonna cooperate now. And I couldn't even speak, you know, I had stuff in my mouth, but I'm like, okay, okay, yeah. So they took the gauze out of my mouth and at that point I just started making stuff up. I started making up stuff to get into the safe, telling them whatever, anything. Um, so they said, okay, you're not lying to us. Oh, no, no. I said, you know, this is how you get in it and whatnot. And I tried to explain it to them. And I think I made up a combination because I didn't know it. So anyways, um, I guess they went back there to get into the safe. And I found out later on that uh, they were in my house digging this safe out of the ground with a jackhammer while the DEA was in there documenting it all. So the DEA is in my house and I have this documented and they're they're in there building their case while the cartel is in there digging my safe out of the ground. Asked my family for a uh, million dollars which of course they didn't have it and you know there's a series of negotiations. Uh, while they had me they uh, brought in an Another guy, a large, uh, heavy set guy that just laid on the ground. He never moved the whole time we were there. Said he was there for some, uh, some kind of a, he had money or something that they wanted, whatever it was, and they were gonna kill him. And they brought a kid in there named Oscar. Oscar uh, owned a restaurant and apparently he had money and he got into it with him for some reason. Oscar cried for the first two days nonstop uh, while they had him. And uh, 
he finally calmed down. Uh, we weren't supposed to communicate, but of course we were. We were also not supposed to look out of our blindfold, but I kept pulling up my blindfold and looking around because I had to know where, where I was and try to see what was going on. Then I'd pull it back down. And uh, at that point they had me uh, leg shot with uh, shackles around my legs and my hands. So I really wasn't going anywhere and the shackles on my legs were pretty tight. They were cutting my ankles so they were bleeding. And they had us in that first safe house for I wanna say probably four or five days. And then one night they said uh, they're, that we're gonna go somewhere. And they had told me that if uh, they, I gave, if they got the money from the safe, which was over a million dollars, that they were gonna release me. Well, they got the money from the safe and then they decided they weren't gonna release me. They wanted more money. So I was a little irritated with them. So uh, they uh, took me and put, put us in another van in the middle of the night and they were escort taking it, driving us to somewhere. And they put me on the phone with my brother, I guess to verify that I was alive. And uh, I said to him, where is Denise, my wife? And he said, we don't know, nobody's seen her. And which was actually not true. They had, she was with him, but they weren't, my brother uh, and the people he was with weren't telling the cartel that my wife was with them because they wanted her too. Um, but they weren't telling me that. So I thought she was dead or something. So I said, well, you have to find her. At that point I was just irritated. So they took us to another safe house and they told me, uh, you're gonna go into a little uh, Harry Potter hole. And I said, I don't wanna go in the Harry Potter hole. And they said, oh, it's okay. It's just a little Harry Potter hole. You're gonna go into it. And I'm thinking this is a grave or something. I don't wanna go. I'm like, I really don't wanna go in the Harry Potter hole. And they're like, oh, you're gonna go in it. So they shoved that big fat man in there. And then they shoved me in and actually they shoved me in first then the fat man and he really stunk bad. And uh, I'm feeling around with my foot to feel the end of this hole. I couldn't feel anything. Anyways, it turned out that Harry Potter hole was a closet underneath a stairway. But you know, I'm blindfolded in the dark, so I don't know what it is. I climbed over the fat man and there was a door there and I pushed my way through the door and plopped out and they kept trying to push me back in and I, I just wasn't gonna stay in there. So I just kept pushing out and I'm like, I can't, I can't stay in this hole. <laughs> so they moved me to the other room where Oscar was and Oscar and I started whispering back and forth when they weren't around. I mean, we could hear them with their machine guns and whatnot when they're in different areas. So we started plotting an escape and uh, because I knew that just we had to get out of there. And we realized that these guards, uh, the main guys would come and do their interrogations and tortures and whatnot in the middle of the night, but um, the guys who were guarding us were just kids with machine guns and they would fall asleep at night and they'd literally be asleep. One night, uh, actually the main guy called over there and woke them up and was chewing them out for being asleep. So we realized that would probably be our chance when they go to sleep. Anyways, we were in that house for, I don't know, two or three days and they came and I, they call him the jefe, came and interviewed me with a, actually literally had a tape recorder hanging from a string in front of my face and he said uh, so we need another million dollars from you and uh, we need your family to give us a million dollars and I said they don't have a million dollars and he said well your family owns jewelry stores I'm like no they don't my brother owns a gym he said well I said it's not worth a million dollars he has no way of getting that money you might as well just kill me now they moved us to another house and the first night this, this was upstairs in, in a room. And the first night they brought in, it was two women and two men. And apparently one of them was the boss, the other was her, their workers. And they uh, were blindfolded, so I couldn't see it, but I could hear they were basically torturing and beating and God knows what they were doing to those women all night long. And then, I don't know if they released the other three or what they, I mean, yeah, the, the two women and that one worker but they were gone the next day and there was just the guy. And Oscar would translate and tell me when they weren't around that supposedly this guy had a million dollars and somebody had seen it and they were trying to get the money out of him. And they beat this guy like I could just hear it 
morning, noon, and night, nonstop. It, I could just hear the beating take place. And even though he was blindfolded and gagged, you could just hear the impact. They just kept beating him. And Oscar told me one time when he went to the restroom, there was blood all over the toilet and everywhere from this guy. And I was pretty sure he probably didn't have that million dollars because I think if he did, he would have given it up after a few days of that beating. It was just nonstop. And uh, they brought in another guy. The story was uh, that he was from a rival cartel and he was in their territory or whatnot. They didn't really interrogate him at all. And what they did is they laid him down flat. I had actually been wondering like how they were gonna kill us, if they're gonna shoot us or I don't know, inject us with something or what. And then I learned how they did it. They laid him down flat face down and they took their boot and they stamped on the back of his neck. Then they wrapped him up in a sheet and tied him up with a cord and left him laying next to me all night long. The next morning they were arguing about who's gonna throw him away because he was heavy. They're just gonna throw him in a dumpster. So that's basically the way we were gonna go out, like cockroaches. So, and at that point they had, they, before that they were coming to me every night talking to me about you know money and how they're gonna get money and I told them I had different storages that in the United States that I could take them to to get more money. I was just telling them anything, try to stay alive. And uh, they stopped talking to me for a couple of days. And I realized that was a really bad sign because basically that means they were not trying to get anything out of me. So the story I had gotten out of the guards from the place I was before was that if you pay, they let you go. And if you don't, they kill you. And my family obviously wasn't coming up with a million dollars. so it was probably pretty inevitable they were gonna kill me. So I told Oscar, I said, uh, you know, we have to get out of here. If we don't, they're gonna kill us. We're gonna have like that guy. And he's like, oh, don't say that. I'm like, well, you saw what happened to that guy last night, we're next. So our first plan was these guys would go to sleep and they had their machine guns. And we thought, well, we would just jump on them and take their machine guns away from them. Um, but, that night they fell asleep and they were actually in the room right in front of us. And I get up and go to the restroom in the middle of the night and they told me if you want to go to the restroom, you have to whistle. You can't be on your feet, you whistle and the guard's gonna take you to the restroom. Well, I had been whistling for half hour and they weren't coming and I couldn't wait. So I hopped up and I, I looked out the door and they're both crashed out in front of the TV just completely asleep. I literally went, took myself to the restroom, came back, they were still asleep. So I was actually walking, looking all around and I couldn't find the guns. I think they were sleeping on top of them. So I told Oscar, I said, I don't see these guns. And Oscar said, well, you could jump on the one, I'll jump on the other. And Oscar was a skinny guy and I didn't trust that. I was like, no way, you know, you're gonna jump on that guy, he's gonna come up with a machine gun and shoot you and then shoot me. I said, look, they're asleep. We could just literally walk right out past them. And before I did that, actually, I went through the other hallway to the back and it was a locked, but it went down into a garage and I saw a couple body bags down there. And I was like, oh no, this is not good. So I, I told Oscar, we'll just like walk out right past him and just walk out of this place. You know, it's too risky. I said, listen, staying here is too risky. I said, I'm going, you can come or not. I said, you want me to go first? You want to go first? He said, you go first. So I literally tiptoed my way right past this guy, um, down the hallway, down the stairwell. And actually, because I was sitting for so long on the ground, my knees were squeaking, going past him, making all kinds of noise, cracking, because he had been sitting on the ground for all this time. But they didn't wake up, and I tiptoed right down the stairs, out the door, and I was in a courtyard, and there was a big fence around it, and the only gate was an electric garage door and I didn't want to push it because I didn't want to make noise so I was looking around to see you know how I was going to get out of here and here comes Oscar and I said there's no way out of here but that door and he's like it was a gate a fence that was probably about uh, 11 feet high and he's like lift me up boost me over this fence so I I lift him up and Oscar actually was so skinny he could get his hands out of the handcuffs he already had his hands out of the handcuffs I couldn't do that I lifted him up, he scaled that fence, and he came down on the other side, boom, making all kinds of noise, and dogs in the neighborhood started barking, and he looks at me through the fence, and he just takes off. 
I'm just like, Pff. well, now I don't have a choice. The dogs are barking. So I push that garage door, it comes scooting up, open, and I s slide under there, and I'm chasing down the road following Oscar, barefoot in the middle of the night, just running down this broken down road in the middle of nowhere. And I catch up to him, and I never ran so fast in my life. I didn't care I was barefoot running over glass and whatnot, I just, I was hauling ass. So I, I chase Oscar down the road, and uh, I catch up to him, actually, and there was a cab pulled up in this uh, street, and the cab looked at me and him and just drove away. So we kept running down the road, and there was a bus depot of some sort right next to a main road, and uh, Oscar ran into the bus depot, and he kind of disappeared. I don't know where, where he went. So I run out on the main road, and I'm trying to wave down cars, but no one's stopping, so I just keep going down the road, and there's a taco stand on the side of the road. And I, I run in there and there's like 20 of these Mexican guys sitting there eating tacos. Here I come in there with, you know, blood all over me, handcuffs and my underwear, rag on my head and I like, and they're like, sit down and have a taco. I'm like, no, I kidnapped, you have to help me. And they're like, ah, oh, sit down and have a taco. I'm like, no, no, kidnapped. They go, you want us to call the police? I'm like, no, the police are kidnappers. Well, I didn't tell you that part. The people don't know this, but the cartel is the police. They don't work with the police, they are the police. In the daytime, they put on their police uniform, and the night, they go around kid kid kidnapping people. They're the same guys. I know because I was with them, and they basically told me that while I was talking to them the whole time. So I'm like, no, 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 no police. And they, actually, the people know, that live down there know this. They get it. People here, they don't believe that, but that's how it is. So anyways, um, I told these guys to take me to the border, I'll pay you. So they're like, all right, come on. So they put me in the back of this van. They said, which border do you want to go to? And I said, Oda Mesa. So they took me to the Oda Mesa border. We pull up there, I jump out and I run up to the border and I'm like, American citizen, let me in. And uh, they uh, <clears throat> looked at me like, he's like, what are you doing? Why are you like this? You know, here I am like bleeding and naked. I'm like, kidnapped, open the fucking gate, let me in. So the guy checks me out for a minute and he comes down and they take the handcuffs off me. And then they, the two guys that brought me to the border, they bring them inside. And I said, no, no, they're cool. They, they helped me get here. And uh, so they put me inside there, gave me a blanket and gave me a sack lunch. And they told me they're gonna call my family. So I gave my family's number. Well, a couple hours goes by and I'm like, something's weird. And they're just like, oh yeah, your family's on their way. And I'm like, I know my family's like been there, somewhere right there. And uh, FBI shows up. So they put me in the room, they, I'm being interviewed by the FBI and I told them all about the whole kidnapping incident. And uh, he didn't know anything about the steroids or anything. He just, I just told him about the kidnapping thing. That they just took me, I didn't say why. And. Uh, then the Mexican police came and they wanted, they asked for me to go back with them to show them where the kidnappers were. And I was like, hell no, I'm not going back in there. They're like, oh, we'll protect you. And I'm like, yeah, I know you're gonna protect me from you. I'm not going in there, I'm not going back. Or I drew you a little map, you can go find it yourself. Besides, I had told them where this house was when I first got there, like five hours earlier. I'm like, those people are long gone and anybody who's in there is probably dead or moved, so. No point, in, I'm not going back in there. So FBI just finished interviewing me about the whole thing and DEA walks in and they're like, all right, we're gonna take him now. And FBI's like, hey, what's going on? I'm like, I don't know. And he's like, there's something you didn't tell me? The DEA's like, come with us. So DEA takes me and they put me in the back of the uh, car. They walk me out the border into their car and they're driving me up to their DEA headquarters and they're asking me, uh, you know, stuff about the case. And they said, you know, we thought you were dead because there was a bodybuilder in the morgue and he was beaten to, uh, beyond recognition. We were sure it was you. They said, you weren't supposed to come back. I was like, yeah, fuck you. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I was just irritated at that point. So I get to the DEA headquarters and they got my wife now. My wife, they called her to come get me. They took her and put her in. And uh, for some reason, they let us see, they, they were gonna give us five minutes together. They told my wife that he's really dirty and you know, this and that. 
So they put me and her in a cell together and I told her don't say anything. Just, she said, I already told them I want my lawyer. So they brought me out and they said, you could help yourself and you could help your wife. You want to just cooperate. I'm like, what am I being charged with? And he said, well, it could be this and it could be that. I said, it could be. I said, how much time is that? He said, it could be five years. I said, I want my lawyer. And the other guy started getting belligerent. One of them in the head guy said, nah, he invoked his rights. That's it. It's over. So they took us to court there down in uh, San Diego and uh, I bonded my wife out on a $100,000 property bond and they were trying to help me with no bond. And I had a real good lawyer came in there, he argued bond. So yeah, I got out on half a million dollar bond and uh, they put the ankle bracelet on me. And I was on bond for God, about three years. And as part of my bond, they said I had to stay in Camarillo and get a job. And I went around looking for a job. There's nothing to do in Camarillo. So I said, what am I gonna do here? So I opened a gym. I figured out, I'll just open up a gym. I had, still had money. So I opened this gym uh, in Camarillo and we ran it for those three years while, while uh, the case was pending. And I was pretty sure I was gonna beat this case because they didn't really have a case. It was all circumstantial. They didn't have one pill me doing anything in the United States. Uh, they were just saying, you know, you did it and we know it. But uh, they finally came after three years and they said, look, if you agree to take this deal uh, for 24 months, we'll let her go. And I always told my wife if anything went wrong, I would make sure she didn't get in any trouble. So I, I went ahead and took it. And uh, I left my wife to run the gym and I went in to TI. And while I was in there, she let the gym go to hell. <laughs> it actually made it almost on its own, almost till I got out. For the, it, it lasted a year with her running it, which was like nobody running it. And then uh, she had just let it go too far, so we had to close down, and now I'm looking to reopen the gym. We actually got a new building, and that's where we're at right now, I'm about to reopen. When I got sentenced, uh, I had actually been on bond and I had agreed to take the 24 months. And I actually didn't know where I was gonna be sent to. And I literally had to call the marshal's office the night before because I was supposed to turn myself in. I didn't even know where to. They hadn't told me. And my lawyer's like, you better find out. <laughs> so uh, I found out I'm supposed to go to TI, which was actually a good thing. I, I think they sent me there for medical because I had some medical things and it's a medical facility. But I got lucky to go to TI because it's close to my home and they still have weights in TI. So I went there and I uh, spent a lot of time lifting weights and I, I took every single trade class they had. They had some college courses. I took all the college courses just to keep busy and to stay out of whatever was going on there. I really just tried to lift weights and stay busy as much as I could. So. Uh, I would be in class from morning till night and then go to the weight pile, lift weights, and back in class, study, and do it again. And just try to keep busy and make the time go by as fast as I could. And I made it a point not to get caught up in the prison stuff that goes on there because I was not interested in getting involved in any of that. I was interested in getting out. <laughs> that was my focus, get out, get back to my gym and my family. Well, they sent me to a halfway house. And in my opinion, the halfway house is sort of like a trap because they put all these restrictions on you and make you jump through so many hoops that they're looking for you to mess up. But I, right away, uh, they said, you know, if you want to get out of the halfway house, you need to have a job. So I went straight to Gold's Gym and I got a job. I know the owner's there, so I got a job just to get out of there. And I would literally leave the halfway house at five in the morning and go to Gold's Gym and I'd stay there at work till nine o'clock at night just to stay away from that place. And I'd work every single day, seven days a week, to stay out of the halfway house. I just lived in Gold's Gym until I finally finished that. Well, right now uh, we're getting ready to reopen my gym. We just got a new building and I still have all my equipment from the old gym and storage. We just signed our lease and uh, we're waiting for city approval and we should be open in the next 45 to 60 days. Meanwhile, I've been uh, training people at Gold's uh, since I've been out, just something to uh, satisfy probation and make some extra money. I can tell you, 
I see a lot of people I've seen go to prison and they get caught up in the whole prison life. For me, you know, I knew that that wasn't my, gonna be my life. I didn't want it to be my life. I, I was not there to make a name for myself in prison to try to be part of all that. I was there to get out. Um, obviously, while you're there trying to stay out of problems, don't get caught up in drugs and gambling because those are the two things that people get in problems the most from. And just try to mind your own business. Um, but I always had it in my head. I was counting the days because me personally, I don't like being locked up. Uh, some people may become, uh, what is the word, institutionalized and they actually get used to it. I never got used to it. I never liked it. I don't like it. I don't want to be there. I have things to do outside. Uh, so, you know, have goals. I went to school. I knew right away when I went in that I needed to do something with myself, productive. And that's not play cards and get caught up in the prison life. That I went to class, took classes, just anything to stay busy. And I always had in my head, you know, what am I going to do when I get out? Not what am I going to do here? I remember talking to this, hearing one guy talk, I don't think I was talking to him, I just overheard him. And his goal in life was when he got out that he was gonna make a lot of money selling dope. So when he came back to prison, he'd have a lot of canteen. <laughs> that was his goal in life. You know, that was his life. I was thinking, what an idiot. <laughs> you have your canteen. <laughs> I, it's not for me. Uh, tuna fish, I don't wanna see another piece of tuna fish in my whole life. Larry Pollock, Fresh Out, Life After the Penitentiary.